Sherlock Holmes considered himself as the only unofficial consulting detective, and rightly so. In point of fact, Holmes worked outside the law. If he'd been a policeman working for Scotland Yard, he would certainly not have had the freedom that allowed him to use his unorthodox methods. This both pleased the police and frustrated them. Pleased them because he almost invariably let such men as Inspector Lestrade and Inspector Gregson take the public recognition for a case that he had solved. Frustrated them because he could literally work on a case using his own specialized abilities while they had to stay within prescribed limits. Yet Holmes did respect the law, for he was in fact an amateur and felt it best to have a healthy relationship with the professional police. This encouraged such men as Lestrade and Gregson to bring various unsolved crimes to him for his solution. His freedom outside the restraints of the law allowed him to assume many roles in disguise and to work with Watson as his accomplice. Excellent examples of this kind of work can be found in such original stories as uh, A Scandal in Bohemia, The Man with the Twisted Lip, and The Illustrious Client, to name but a few. He often broke open safes to get information, set fires to force some action out of an individual, such as uh, Irene Adler, or broke into homes in order to gain access to information that would lead to the solving of the crime. Any admonitions by the police were soon dropped when Holmes produced the criminal or solved the crime. Most of this work was done by Holmes and Watson in London or various other parts of England. In The Waltz of Death, Holmes and Watson find themselves in Vienna on a case. Now here, on foreign territory, and completely outside the orthodox methods of the English police, Holmes had even more free reign. He still used his brilliant sense of deductive logic, but now he did not have to worry about reprimands from Scotland Yard. And besides, there was new excitement for Holmes when he could deal with murder from other than the English criminal. Join me now as we present Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Waltz of Death. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells you another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'm going to tell you about a swell idea. The idea of serving Petri California sherry before dinner. Tomorrow night, just before dinner, instead of that last-minute rush, take it easy. Pour yourself a glass of Petri sherry. Now, if you'll do that just once, I wouldn't have to say another word about Petri sherry. You'd be a customer for life. Because Petri sherry is good wine with a capital good. Judge that Petri sherry any way you like. By its beautiful amber color, its heart of the grape aroma, or by the best test of all, its flavor. Petri sherry is delicious. And you have a choice of two kinds, Petri regular and Petri pale dry sherry. If you're not sure which you'll like better, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. All set for tonight's story? Yes, my bow. I'm all set, as you put it. It began in Vienna in 1889. The old Vienna of bright lights, lovely ladies, and lilting music. And what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing there, Doctor? Mr. Bartell, what were we doing there? Yes, sir. Were you just taking a trip? Oh, in those early days of our association, we didn't have either the time or the money for trips. No, we were in Vienna at the express command of the Emperor Franz Josef. It was in October, I remember, that we arrived in the city, and for several days we were forced to cool our heels awaiting the imperial pleasure. 
that on one of those idle evenings at the good services of our friend, the chief of police, Count Frano, secured us an invitation to a resplendent ball that was being held at the palace of Princess Stephanie von Kram. It was an incredibly colorful spectacle, Mr. Bartell. A string orchestra high in the gallery of the palace ballroom played a haunting Strauss waltz, while on the floor below, the cream of Viennese aristocracy swayed and glided gaily to the lilting music. I can remember the picture so well, Mr. Bartell, that Holmes and I stood there talking to the chief of police, Count Prado. A colorful scene, is it not, gentlemen? By George, yes, Captain Father. It must be a real holiday for you and Mr. Holmes. What makes you say that, Watson? Well, it's hard to think of the criminal world when one looks at such a gathering. And yet Count Profano knows as well as I do that the criminal is not confined to class or environment. Indeed, no, Mr. Holmes. I can assure you that every guest here tonight has been scrutinized as he entered. Yes, I imagine that many plain clothes men are present in this room now, aren't they, Count Profano? Oh, yes. We take no chances. I suppose you can't afford to. There's enough jewelry being worn here tonight for a king's ransom, I should say. Ah, the waltz is finished. Now I can present you to our hostess, Princess von Kram. Stephanie, my pigeon. My pigeon? Must know the princess pretty well. Yes, I'm glad to see that in Vienna, the profession of criminal detection carries no social stigma. Allow me to present you Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, the Princess Stephanie von Kram. I'm very honored to meet you, Your Highness. I'm most happy to meet you, gentlemen. Permit me to introduce my protege, Janos Hervat. The Hungarian composer. Thank you, Miss This ball <coughs> tonight, you? Mr. Holmes, will mark a rare occasion. A signal honor is to be conferred on Herr Horvath and myself before tonight is through. The next waltz is a new composition of his. Tonight will be its debut. Indeed, how very interesting. It is a great honor the princess has conferred on me. A new composition could not possibly be presented under more auspicious circumstances. Count Frana, you spoke of an honor in connection with yourself. May I tell them our secret, Stephanie? No, I will tell them myself, Anatole. After your waltz has been played, Janusz, and Anatole and I shall be the first to have the privilege of dancing to it, my father is to make a public announcement. He is to announce my engagement to Count Anatole Refon. Oh, indeed, my congratulations, congratulations. you both. Yes, very lucky fellow. Well, Am I not the luckiest of men? Is she not exquisite? I, the gay man of Vienna, the cavalier who swore that no one woman would ever capture him, I confess it, gentlemen, I'm in love. Oh, oh, but I pity you. Even the great waltzes of old Vienna could hardly be worthy of this moment. <laughs> oh, Anatole, you are a born flatterer. Oh, come, the waltz is about to begin. I shall see you, gentlemen, later. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <clears throat> the orchestra is tuning up there, Horvat. I imagine this is a great moment for you. A very frightening one, I assure you, my friend. In a few minutes, I shall know whether my new work is to be crowned with success or failure. Count Frano is leading the princess to the center of the floor. The conductor is raising his battle. This is your moment, Herr Horvath. Good luck. Pray for me, gentlemen. Pray for me. Here they go, the princess and Count Frano. They're starting the waltz. Ah, they make a striking pair, don't they? Here come the other couples out on the floor. Charming. Quite charming. It reminds me of... Great Scott, Captain. That was a revolver shot. It's the princess. She's been shot. Come on, Watson. Out of the way, please. Out of the way. Count from final. What happens? Stephanie, Dr. Watson, see what you can do for her. Count from Frano, there's... There's nothing I can do, I'm afraid. She was shot through the brain. She died instantly. Stephanie is dead. Stop that devilish music. Lock all the doors. There's a murderer to be found. Count Rafano, have you found any clues? One of my men found a revolver. It had been tossed into the earth of a potted palm. May I see it, please? Of course, here. Rammed into the soft earth. Confound it. Count Rafano, your fiancée was an extremely beautiful woman. You must have had rivals. Yes, several, but none of them are present tonight. Uh, who will inherit her estate? A six-month-old nephew. Who's his guardian? The Emperor Franz Josef himself. No, no, Mr. Holmes. I know of no obvious motive for someone wishing poor Stephanie dead. Well, perhaps it was a political crime. She was a wealthy aristocrat and a very prominent one. Yes, that's very possible. 
Many nihilist assassins have been active in my country recently. Meanwhile, we have a ballroom full of suspects waiting for us. I was just going to suggest we went back there. We can't find out very much by staying here in the library. It's a delicate matter. Almost everyone present tonight is known to me personally. Uh, May I suggest that you go back to the ballroom and have the male guests file past you? Detain for questioning anyone whose evening clothes do not fit perfectly. Clothes don't fit? What's the cut of a man's clothes got to do with this? Anyone invited to such a ball as this would naturally have his own tailor. I think, Count Profano, if you found a man who had to hire his costume, uh, he might be an imposter and may well prove to be your assassin. Well, Mr. Holmes, your plan has not been effective so far. We find one Englishman who is unusually badly dressed, and what do we discover? He's an English milord whose luggage was lost on the train. Yes, and the second suspect proved to be a perfectly respectable Viennese doctor whose nasty little child had taken a last-minute snip at his tailcoat with a pair of scissors. And the third was poor Horvath, the composer, who cannot yet afford a good dress suit, eh? Well, Count Rufano, why not have the next suspect shown in? Yes, of course. Shoba, bring in the next man. Yeah, yeah, Count. Come and see Herr Einbitter. Einbitter? What a frightful looking fellow. Your name, please. My name is Groening. What do you wish with me? Groening? Your name was not on the list of invitations. Uh, one moment, please. Let me see your right hand, Herr Groening. You have no right to touch me. Uh, where did you get these fresh earth stains? Your right thumb is pitted and the nail is full of dirt. What does that poor policeman... Not a short while ago, you tried to hide your revolver by ramming it into an earth-filled flower pot. You know that revolver, please, Count Rufano. It will be easy to compare the samples of earth. It will not be necessary. Well, you, you admit that you murdered the princess tonight, then? Certainly, I admit it. Why did you kill her? She was an aristocrat. She was an oppressor of the poor. I'm glad I killed her. One day, I and my party will kill all of you filthy aristocrats. Count Rufano, put down that revolver. Shoot him like the dark he is. No, 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 Count Rufano. Even you can't take the law into your own hands. Why do you not shoot me? I'm not afraid to die. You haven't taken away, Shoba. Nehmt den Hund ins Gefängnis. Thank you for stopping my hand just now, Doctor. But when he spoke of Stephanie that way, I could have killed him just as he killed her. Very understandable impulse, sir, but... Uh, one that would have ruined your life. My life? Now that she is dead, my life is empty. What right do love and beauty have to exist in a world that no longer holds Stephanie? She was all light and life, loveliness. And now... But I am hardly displaying my Viennese blood, am I? The murder is caught, thanks to you, Mr. Holmes, and... My life, such as it is, must go on. Somehow, it must go on. And that's how the story began, Mr. Bartell. It began? It sounds like the end of a story to me, Doctor. Far from it, my boy. The next day, Holmes and I had our interview with His Imperial Majesty and learned the nature of the services expected of us. Services that required our leaving the city. And that's why, my boy, we were gone from Vienna for some weeks. We didn't know that during our absence, Herr Hovitz waltz which had had such a tragic debut, was beginning to make a sort of morbid history. Uh, yes, Herr Baron, the Horvath Waltz. We have had many requests for it. Gladly, we will play it, Herr Baron. Isn't that the Horvath Waltz they are playing? Yes, my dear, and see who is walking out to the floor to dance to it. Leah Mollenstein, the actress. Beautiful creature. Are you trying to make me jealous, Hans? Oh! and Himmel, it's Leah Wallstein. She's been shot. A new ballet, and to the music of the Horvath Waltz. Magnificent. Never has Krasnova danced better. Have you ever seen such exquisite pirouettes?
six deaths in four weeks, Shoba. All beautiful women and all killed to the music of the Horvath Waltz. It was a homicidal madman at Lodge in Vienna. There's only one thing to be done. We must forbid absolutely the playing of that waltz by imperial decree. We'll hear all of this, Mr. Bartell, until we return to Vienna. And then, I suppose, Sherlock Holmes was drawn into the case again, Doctor. Yes, my boy. Holmes immediately made a close study of the newspaper reports on the tragedies. And it was with great difficulty that I tore him away from his investigations to attend the reception at which the Emperor was to thank us for our services on the mission that we just completed. As we arrived at the Imperial Palace, almost the first person we ran into was the Hungarian composer, Janusz Hova. Dr. Watson, you have heard of the tragedies connected with my waltz? Yes, we have indeed, sir. We have indeed. I was making a close study of the newspaper reports on them just before I came here. You must do something, Mr. Holmes. People will hardly listen to other music. They want my waltz, but that is forbidden. I'm losing a reputation and a fortune while that waltz remains unplayed. Or perhaps, Herr Horvat, you are laying an excellent foundation for a later reputation and fortune. What do you mean? All this publicity, however distasteful to you at the moment, must in the long run prove invaluable. Ah, there you are, my dear Count Rufano. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm, I'm glad to see you back in Vienna. You've heard of the murders? Yes, Count. We were just discussing them. I need your help again, my good friend. For over a month now, the murder has been at large, and I cannot seem to get on the stage. Well, I'm crooning the first killer. What have you done with him? Released him. What? Released him? Great Scott, why? At the hearing, it was obvious the man was an egomaniac. He boasted of the murder of Stephanie, apparently out of pure vanity. The liberal newspaper editors made quite an issue of the case. They brought pressure to bear, and we had to let him go. Confound it! I wish I hadn't left Vienna. Well, if the fellow's at large again, Count Rufran, it's pretty obvious that he's the murderer of the other women, too. On the contrary, Doctor, he was in prison until yesterday. The last of the murders was committed three days ago. Oh, shh. Here comes his Imperial Highness, Franz Josef. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Your Hi. Highness. Good evening. Your Highness. Well, well, I see we have very distinguished company tonight. Not only the masterful Sherlock Holmes, and his colleague, Dr. Watson, are English friends that we are honoring. But I see that we have a distinguished representative from our Hungarian Empire, Janos Horvat, a worthy successor, I'm told, to the breed of composers for whom Vienna is famous. Your Imperial Highness is most kind. There's a pipe organ in here. It's in excellent condition, I am told. Will you not play as one of your compositions, Herr Horvat? Well, I shall be most honored, Your Highness. Sit down, gentlemen, sit down. Thank you. What shall I play, Your Imperial Highness? Anything you wish, young man. Anything you wish. Thank you, Your Highness. With your permission, I choose to play... Great heavens! He's playing the death waltz. On your guard, Watson. Even in the Imperial Palace itself, this twirling tune may invoke murder. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, which just gives me time to remind you that if any one wine could be called the perfect wine for almost any occasion, that one wine would be Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is not only a fine before dinner wine, but it's wonderful after dinner too. And of course, when you're entertaining or when guests drop in, whether in the afternoon or evening, there's nothing better than a glass of Petri Sherry. And it's comforting to know that you can serve Petri Sherry proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. Dr. Watson, you certainly left me hanging on a cliff that time. You broke off your story just as the Hungarian composer started to play his ill-fated waltz to the Emperor Franz Joseph. What happened? At the time, my boy, fortunately, nothing happened. Herr Hovart completed his composition without apparent incident, and shortly afterwards we attended a banquet that was given in our honor. A banquet that concluded with a rather curious ceremony at which the Emperor presented Sherlock Holmes with a medal to commemorate his services. I don't know what anything was. Oh, 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 never mind about that. Finally, it was shortly after 10 o'clock, I remember, Holmes and I, together with Count Rufrano, left the royal chambers and started to descend the spiral staircase leading to the main hall. You were greatly honored tonight, Mr. Holmes. I have only known his imperial highness to make three such presentations before, and they were all to my own countrymen. Oh, he might have made another while he was about no, it. Please, Watson, please. Oh, 
The Emperor was most kind. I can't help feeling that he over-evaluated my You're services. You're being though. unusually modest, Holmes. Perhaps because I feel that my visit here is incomplete until I've solved the death waltz murders. I hope you'll be able to stay in Vienna long enough to do that. I confess I am at my wit's end. I've been giving the matter a great deal of thought, Count Rufano. I have a plan for trapping the killer. It's in rather an embryonic stage at the moment, but over a few pipes at the hotel tonight, I expect to develop it thoroughly. I shall call at your office in the morning and explain it to you. I shall be awaiting your visit eagerly. Oh, one more of these murders in the newspaper outcry might become so loud that I should have to resign my post as chief of police. Well, when Hobart made that daring gesture and played the death waltz tonight, it proved one thing. It's not infallible. The death of a beautiful woman doesn't always follow the playing of the melody. I'm very true, Doctor, but... What? Uh, yes, sir? Strike a match, will you? Huh? There's a figure here slumped on the landing. Great Scott, it's the body of a girl. And a very beautiful girl, too. Drop through the forehead. You were wrong, Watson. The death waltz is infallible. But I swear to you that the killer has struck for the last time. Ah, there you are, my dear Count Plano. Yes, I followed the instructions you gave me this morning, Mr. Holmes. Chainbaum says at the moment the smartest restaurant in Vienna. I preserved the best table for you, and I've invited the guests that you named. A strangely assorted couple, I must say. Janos Horvat, the composer, and that grinning fellow, the one that admitted shooting your your fiancé, Count Plano. It's as much as I could do to keep my hands off him when he arrived here, Doctor. But Mr. Holmes insisted that I ask him. Just the same, I wish you would tell me his plan. I'm completely in the dark. Completely in the dark. I can sympathize with you, Count Refrano. Holmes never tells me a thing either. Let's join our guests, shall we? In a very few minutes, I'm sure that my uh, plan will be perfectly apparent. Good evening, Herr Horvath. Oh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. How do you do, Herr Horvath? And how are you tonight, Herr Groening? Angry at having to come here against my will. My party does not approve of these aristocratic padded pigsties. But Count Refrano informed me that if I did not come here tonight, I could expect to find myself back in prison. How could I resist such a persuasive invitation? Ah, here comes the third guest for our table. I uh, met her at the hotel a few hours ago. Oh, Miss Banks, I'm so glad that you were able to come. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I didn't know this was going to be a party, but I couldn't be happier. Allow me to present you, Count Refrano, Dr. Watson, Herr Horvat, Herr Gruning, Miss Barbara Banks from the United States oh, of America. How do you do, uh, how do, you do uh, Holmes? I wish I knew what you're up to. And how can a young American girl afford to come to the enemy, I ask? Of course you can ask. My father made a lot of money, and he wanted me to have the advantages he never had. Your father made money because he ground the faces of the poor. Oh, my father never ground a poor face in his life. He was a capitalist. I spit on him. Oh, that's rather unfriendly. And also, geographically speaking, something of a problem. You see, he's living in Wyoming. You make fun of me. <laughs> Only because you made fun of me. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I did as you asked me. I'm very grateful, Miss Banks. The orchestra leader didn't want to play it. He, he seemed scared. But I waved a lot of money in front of him, and I promised to pay the fine as well. Splendid. Great Scott, I see it all now. So do I. You persuaded Miss Banks to bribe the orchestra leader to play My waltz. My forbidden waltz? Yes, Herr Horvath. I felt that if the request came from a young American, it might seem quite reasonable. Particularly if the requests were accompanied by American talus crowned out of the faces of the poor. You are being unpleasant to me, aren't you? They're playing at your waltz, Herr Horvath. The death waltz. Mr. Holmes, this is against the law. The Horvath waltz is forbidden by imperial decree. True, nonetheless, my dear Count, I implore you not to arrest the orchestra leader until after the waltz is completed. In which case, since I requested it and it's still playing, I'd like a partner. W will you dance with me, Count Refrano? I'm sorry, Miss Banks, but to this melody I shall never dance again. Oh. Well, how about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, I like you very much, my dear, but I'm afraid I'm not as light on my, on my feet as I used to be. In any case, I was never much of a hand at the waltz. See, <laughs> polka's more in my line. Dear <laughs> me, I'm getting an inferiority complex. Oh, please do not, Miss Banks. You'll observe that the general public seems singularly unwilling to dance, too. Not one couple has ventured onto the floor. Oh, can you blame them? The waltz with Horvath may mean death. How can you blame them? I'm not afraid. After all, Herr Horvath, it's your own music. I'll dance with you. You're most kind, Miss Banks, and courageous. But to be a partner of the only woman on the floor would mean ruin. 
an admission of failure. My third refusal? I'm a wallflower. No, my dear Miss Spanks, the aristocrats, they are afraid. But I, plain, simple groaning, I will dance with you, Miss Millions. Oh, bless you, Herr Groening. And I assure you, my father does not grind the faces of the poor. He does grind the faces of the poor, this I Stop know. Stop her, it's suicide. I think not, Herr Horvath. I think so. And I'll not stay here to watch it. Where the devil's he off to? Do not worry, Doctor. I shall keep an eye on him. Yes, and we'll keep an eye on both of them. Come on, Watson. So that is, he's leaving the room. But as Count Rolfrano has deserted his trail and has slipped behind one of those pillows. Good Lord, he, he's drawing a revolver. Exactly, Watson. He's our man. Put down that revolver, Count Rolfrano. Put it down, I say. He's turning it on himself. Count Rolfrano! <laughs> I still can't believe it, Holmes. Not the fact that Count Frano blew his brains out, but the fact that he was a murderer. Yes, I was slow to believe it too, old chap, and I blame myself for consequence. Two things should have been instantly apparent about the madman who killed beautiful women when he heard the Horvath waltz. Firstly, he must have had some motivation which drove him to such an act. Secondly, he must have carried a revolver with him at all times, since he was invariably armed when the occasion presented itself. Exactly, and that factor made me think of the... Police official. Then, of course, I saw Rufrano's motivation. He loved the Princess Stephanie dearly. Her death in his arms was a psychological shock that was more than his mentality could stand. And when he heard that music, it reminded him of the dead princess and forced him to kill. That's right, old fellow. You will recall that um, what he said to us after his fiancée's death. What right do love and beauty have to exist in a world that no longer holds Stephanie? When he heard the music, he couldn't bear to think that other loveliness existed, and so, well, he, he destroyed it. But who killed the Princess Stephanie? The man who was first arrested for it, Herr Grinning. He admitted it. After a little persuasion, when the police arrived, taken back to prison in the carriage that just took Count Frano's body. It's shocking to think that seven innocent women have been murdered before this case was solved. Yes, a fact that will be a constant reproach to me, I assure you. Oh, I didn't mean that, my dear fellow. We weren't even in Vienna when five of the killings took place. Hello, hello. Here comes Miss Banks. Mr. Holmes, what happened to that funny little man who danced with me? Herr Grinning? Mm -hmm. He went to prison, Miss Banks. He was a murderer. Well, I must say this is a strange kind of a party you asked me to, Mr. Holmes. One of the guests blows his brains out, and the other, the only man who danced with me, turns out to be a murderer. Oh, I see now why Father sent me to Europe. An evening like this could never happen in Wyoming. Look, look, look. Helvet's walking out in, in front of the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen. Shh, shh. Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, I almost thought of that wish to assure you upon the word of the great English detective Sherlock Holmes that never again shall my new waltz be an accompaniment for murder. <laughs> Henceforth, its melody will be for life and love and laughter. I have ordered a bottle of the finest cocktail sent to each of your tables. Raise your glasses and pledge me as I now conduct my waltz. Free at last from the kiss of death. Say, Doctor, I, I, I really like that story. That was a baffle. Yes, wasn't it? A highly placed police official is the last person in the world you'd think guilty of murder. I must confess I wasn't of so much to help to, to Holmes in solving that case. Oh, don't let that worry you, Doctor. After all, Holmes almost missed solving it himself. Oh, thank you, my boy. Very nice of you. Thank you, boy. But it certainly was one of the most interesting cases that I was ever connected with. I know what you mean. You know, I, I came across quite an interesting case myself the other day. Oh, you don't say where? Right in my own house. Oh, that's interesting. Well, what kind, what kind of case? Sherry. Oh, good gracious me, Sherry. <laughs> that's right, a case of Petri California Sherry. You see, I buy it by the case, Doctor, because that Petri wine is really extraordinary. But all Petri wine is unusual wine, unusually good, because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Because this is so... And because the Petri business has been owned and operated by the Petri family ever since its beginning, and is today the largest independent family-owned wine company in America, naturally the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family 
that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. Naturally good wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Illustrious Client. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. At first, when Herr Gruning confessed to the killing of the Princess von Kran, I didn't believe it. When the other women were killed, I felt sure that Herr Groening was innocent. I at least suspected Count Refrano of having committed the other murders. But then, that's exactly what Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher wanted, don't you think? The two episodes you have just heard, The Out-of-Date Murder and The Waltz of Death, are part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1988 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Ben Wright. Won't you join me again soon for more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes? Thank you for listening.